do this right. Now we're recording session number four of New Testament survey, beginning in the Gospel of Matthew at chapter eight. Hey, welcome everybody. It's uh, good, good to see everybody. I'm just watching the uh, watching the group accumulate here. It's it's always fun. Uh, I'm uh, uh, always thankful for everyone who comes to uh, learn more about the Bible. That's what we're here for. Uh, and uh, uh, those who can't be here at uh, class time uh, can pick this up on Facebook and uh, even on YouTube. Uh, so the, the modern computer has made some amazing things possible for us. And I'm very thankful for that. Uh, we are in the Gospel of Matthew. Let me just share that screen uh, right away quick, uh, because that's the easy way to do this. We, uh, we finished up the Sermon on the Mount on Monday. On, uh, uh, it, we're told that when he came down from the mountain, it was followed by crowds. And from chapters uh, eight through 10, really three chapters here, uh, what Matthew is presenting is uh, what uh, some commentators have called the, the signs of the kingdom, others have called the credentials of the king. And that's the, uh, that's the heading that I'm using. Uh, what Jesus is doing here is a series of uh, uh, miracles, for the most part, or arguments in some cases, uh, to uh, demonstrate his authority. So power over disease, power over demons, power over men in a variety of ways, power over nature, he's going to steal a storm here, uh, the power to forgive, there is entering into a dispute. Uh, in a lot of these, we're going to see lurking around the edges of Jesus' ministry uh, by chapter eight uh, are going to be the uh, scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, the scribes and Pharisees are two different groups, really, but they seem to work together. Uh, and uh, we often see Jesus going after them uh, as though they were one group. So scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites is a fairly famous thing for Jesus to say. Um, in each of these uh, demonstrations of his power, uh, Jesus is um, uh, demonstrating authority. He is the king. And as the king, who is also the creator, uh, he, can, he can exercise tremendous authority. Now, uh, Jesus' authority is not arbitrary. That is, uh, Jesus can't do things that are contrary to his own nature. Uh, so uh, uh, he can't... Uh, 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 he can't make the law of gravity work differently every day just for the fun of it, um, because there are some things that even God can't do. God can't operate against his own nature. Uh, nevertheless, Jesus is able to, uh, on occasion, uh, violate apparent laws of nature uh, for the purpose of demonstrating uh, his authenticity. Uh, we mentioned in the Old Testament that the purpose of miracles uh, is to authenticate God's messenger with God's message. And this was true during the years of Moses and Joshua. It was then true during the years of Elijah and Elisha. The third episode of miracles in the Bible uh, is during the time of Christ and the lives of the apostles who followed him. So Christ and the apostles or the New Testament church. 
And by the time we come to the end of the book of Acts, uh, it appears that the episode of miracles has come to a conclusion. Normally today, we don't expect miracles uh, in, the, uh, in the biblical sense of miracles. That does not mean that we don't expect God to work. But every act of God is not a miracle. Uh, uh, God often answers prayer, and sometimes he does wonderful things for us. And we should always thank him for those things. Uh, but those things are not usually miracles in the biblical sense of the term. Uh, and uh, we covered that in the Old Testament. Uh, we're going to see more examples of that here. Uh, this all starts out, Jesus came down off the mountain, chapter 8. The this first, uh, first few verses, he's going to... Uh, exercise some power over uh, disease, uh, starts off by cleansing a leper. Uh, a leprosy is a, uh, uh, I, I believe it's a viral infection. Uh, and uh, during Old Testament times or during New Testament times, there was no cure for leprosy. Uh, people got it and they either uh, died with it or they didn't. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, they, uh, their immune systems fought it off and they survived, and other times they didn't. Uh, their bodies just slowly deteriorated until they died. Uh, today, there are uh, treatments for leprosy. Leprosy is still uh, known in, uh, in parts of the world. Uh, typically in very undeveloped places with no medical infrastructure. Uh, but that was the whole world in biblical times. Uh, there was nothing they could do. Uh, so the, a leper came and knelt before him saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hands and touched him and said, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus warned him not to tell anybody. This is going to be a common pattern. Uh, we'll get, we'll get uh, people who come to Jesus with uh, random health concerns, uh, up to and including uh, death. Uh, and uh, uh, Jesus chooses to, to heal them. Uh, the, uh, the second episode is a centurion. He entered Capernaum. And a centurion came toward him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is paralyzed, suffering terribly. Uh, and uh, uh, Jesus said, I will come and heal him. And the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. <laughs> Jesus really liked that. Uh, so he compliments the centurion on his on his faith, um, because uh, the centurion understands that Jesus has the authority to give commands. Uh, one of the nice things about being a military officer is that you don't have to do everything. There are people that you can give orders to who will do that. Uh, it is nice the way the structure works. Uh, and uh, uh, Jesus, of course, understood how that worked. And here's a centurion who also understands how that works. A centurion is a, a, a Roman officer, but he's an interesting kind of officer. We're going to run into a lot of centurions uh, in uh, the Gospels. Jesus interacts with several of them. Uh, including one who witnessed uh, his death. Uh, the uh, centurion is the lowest level of Roman officer, uh, or we could say the highest level of Roman enlisted man. A centurion normally rises up through the ranks as a uh, career soldier. Uh, it was not a bad deal. Uh, a man could go into the Roman army and uh, uh, typically spend a lifetime 
uh, he would uh, retire when he was no longer able to march out to war, uh, usually in his mid to later 40s, maybe 50 years old, and he'd be done. Uh, and uh, after that time, he would receive a plot of ground. Uh, he could marry and raise a family uh, and uh, own a piece of actual property as a Roman citizen. And it wasn't a bad deal at all. Uh, those who were particularly competent would rise through the ranks of the enlisted army uh, and could get as high as centurion. A centurion was nominally in charge of a hundred men. Uh, and that hundred might be subdivided into smaller units, uh, but uh, a centurion had direct command over a hundred men. He would live with those men, he would train those men, he would organize them for uh, living in the field, he would deploy them for battle, he would fight with them when a uh, battle happened. Uh, the centurion was the equivalent of the modern uh, sergeant in most armed forces or in the Navy, what we call a, a chief. Uh, I don't know why the Navy doesn't have sergeants. Uh, they have uh, uh, chiefs instead. Uh, and uh, the Marine Corps is even worse. They have all different kinds of sergeants. Uh, but uh, the, the sergeant is what's called a non-commissioned officer. Now, above the centurions, the Romans had several more layers of officers. And unfortunately, those were all political appointments. Uh, they were put into uh, their positions as officers uh, because of their connections to the nobility, uh, because of their wealth, because of their political clout one way or another. Uh, and uh, many times a, a young nobleman would go off and be an officer for a while uh, because it was a good political move. He could go on from there to the Senate or something, something else powerful so he could make a whole bunch of money. Uh, and uh, some of the Roman officers were actually quite good, and many of them were quite ridiculously bad. Uh, and it was the uh, it was a large body of centurions who were the institutional memory and the uh, the long term uh, morale center of the Roman army. It was the centurions who actually uh, led men into battle. Uh, so centurions really understood about being under authority because they had officers over them, uh, but they understood about having men under them who would do as they were told. Uh, so the centurion says, I understand about this authority thing. All you need to do is give the order. <laughs> And Jesus says, wow, that, that's great. He said, I've, I've uh, never seen anyone in Israel with such faith. Uh, so lots of people are going to hear about this. Uh, so go on home. Uh, your servant is healed from this moment, which is a pretty amazing thing to do. All Jesus needed to do was give the order. Uh, and uh, uh, as, uh, just as it is in heaven, <laughs> so it was on earth. Remember, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When Jesus gives an order in heaven, uh, somebody salutes smartly and gets it done right then. And that's how it happened here. Uh, from there in uh, uh, verses 14 uh, through 17, we see uh, the, the healing of, uh, of quite a number at uh, Peter's house in uh, uh, Capernaum. Peter's mother-in-law was sick and he touched her hands and the fever left her. Uh, we could say that Jesus maybe was uh, uh, just doing something practical here because Peter's mother-in-law was at the moment uh, badly needed to serve dinner. Uh, but I think that, that it was maybe more that he was a nice guy. 
So he healed the mother-in-law and she immediately began making dinner. Uh, demonic forces are uh, listed in several places in this chapter. Uh, the uh, uh, demonic is something we're not going to spend a whole bunch of time with. Uh, we're going to go to a, a directly to a, a passage with that. Uh, and I, I want to uh, I want to talk about demons. In uh, uh, chapters eight and nine, we see that Jesus has power over uh, men. In uh, eight twenty three, we see power over the storm. He got into a boat. There arose a great storm. Everybody was scared. He said, "Peace be still," and the uh, storm stopped. Uh, the, his uh, disciples said, "What sort of man is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him." I love that. Uh, in uh, chapter nine, we see uh, uh, the uh, healing of a paralytic, which is actually the uh, uh, the forgiving of sin, which is easier. Is arguing with the uh, with the Pharisees uh, to say your sins are forgiven or to say, rise up and walk. But just so you'll know that I've got the power to forgive sins, rise up and walk is kind of cute. Uh, Jesus uh, uh, power over uh, men, nine, nine, the calling of Matthew. He can call anybody he wants. Jesus came up to Matthew and said, follow me. And so he did, he dropped everything. And uh, after that, we see Jesus with, tax collectors and sinners and having a wonderful time at dinner uh, with the expl explanation to the Pharisees uh, that uh, uh, those who are well don't need a physician, but those who are sick, it's kind of fun. Uh, in uh, the latter part of uh, chapter nine, beginning of verse uh, 18, we see uh, a, a daughter who has just died. Uh, and uh, uh, Jesus went to heal her. The uh, power over darkness actually means um, power over blindness. And we see that in verse 27 and following. Uh, dumbness is uh, the inability to speak. He heals that. So let's look at a couple of uh, specific passages here. Uh, I like uh, the, uh, the healing of the Gadarene demoniacs. It's, um, it's just fun. Uh, two demon-possessed men on the other side, on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Gadarene is sometimes pronounced Gerazin. Uh, we, the transliteration is, uh, is difficult and it's confusing, uh, but it's the northeast corner of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, this photograph in the background is not terribly clear, but you can see there's a rugged ground. It's a, it's a cliff, uh, a very steep area leading down toward the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the basalt stones that you see in the foreground are a part of a, uh, part of a church building that was built in the fourth century over, uh, over the site of this particular miracle. Uh, and uh, this, is a, this is kind of a cute miracle. Uh, I enjoy this miracle. Uh, he, uh, da, 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 da. Where is this demon? Okay. Uh, so we got two demon possessed men that came out, came out from some tombs, and they were fierce, and nobody could go that way. And they cried out, "What do you have to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come to torment us?" And so there were a herd of pigs nearby. Now we know this was a Gentile area because of all the pigs. Jews were not supposed to raise pigs. And, uh, typically, they didn't in New Testament times. Uh, so the demons begged Jesus, saying, if you cast us out, send us away into a herd of pigs. And Jesus said, that's fine. You go into the pigs. And so out they came and went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. Uh, so scholars have... Uh, uh, jokingly called this the miracle of the deviled ham. Uh, <laughs> we sent the demons into those uh, into those pigs over there. So this is the miracle of the deviled ham. 
and the the church that is built here uh, is called uh, Kursi. Uh, K U R S I is the name of the place, but uh, I've always called it the Church of the Deviled Ham uh, because this is uh, where that miracle uh, was done. Uh, we've already talked about the um, uh, faith of the centurion, chapter eight. The calming of the storm uh, leads the people to say, what sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? It's important for us to understand here in chapter eight that uh, the disciples really don't know. They, they really haven't figured it out yet. Jesus is supplying evidence, bits and pieces of evidence that are going to demonstrate a, uh, uh, the truth of a proposition. The proposition is uh, uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand in the person of the king. So the king has come. Uh, and that's about as far as he's going to go. By the time we get to chapter 16, we're going to see that they finally sort of get it. They kind of understand. But here in chapter eight, they don't have it yet. Uh, they recognize uh, they can call on him to help save them. And uh, he rebuked the wind and the sea and there was a calm and they marveled. <laughs> what sort of a man is this? They thought perhaps a prophet. Okay, the paralytic uh, was taken, uh, a, uh, Jesus saw their faith. People brought a paralytic to Jesus. Uh, he said, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes said, this man is blaspheming. Jesus said, why do you think evil in your hearts? Which is easier? Your sins are forgiven or rise and walk? But so that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth. That's the key to this passage. Uh, so that you may know that the son of man has authority. Rise, pick up your bed and walk. And away he went. Uh, as far as Jesus was concerned, the healing of uh, paralysis was a minor thing. Uh, it was a demonstration he could make of the major thing, which is the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins will get you into heaven. Uh, the, the healing of paralysis uh, will cause a, a temporary easing of, uh, of trouble. Uh, and obviously it's important to the paralytic to be healed. Uh, but in the larger scheme of things, that's fairly minor. The really big deal, your sins are forgiven. Uh, and uh, that's what we have to finally understand. Uh, in uh, chapter nine, there's a passage I, I really like. Uh, the end of uh, chapter nine, Jesus heals the paralytic. Uh, oh, you no, know, the, uh, the harvest. <laughs> well, here I am, uh, they uh, got blind men. Okay, uh, Jesus went through the cities and the villages. This is all over Galilee. Uh, what, uh, what people today don't understand is that this was a fairly heavily populated area. Uh, there were lots of small Jewish villages, really. Uh, some of them were large enough to be called cities uh, in the ancient standard and some were just tiny little villages. Uh, we've found quite a few of these. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, today, uh, tourists will visit places like Katsrin and uh, 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 Capernaum, uh, Chorazin, Bethsaida. Those, those, uh, those villages are all there. There were quite a lot more settlements around the Sea of Galilee, uh, fishing villages mostly, uh, than there are today. Uh, today, most of the Sea of Galilee is fairly empty. There's not, not much there. Uh, the reason for that, well, the reason is complicated in a lot of politics. Uh, the, uh, the Syrian border uh, used to be very close and it was quite dangerous to live 
in those areas. Uh, today, that's getting better, but it's still not a place where people live. Uh, but Jesus went out and he was healing their diseases and he saw the crowds and had compassion because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, and this is the, the key phrase in this chapter, I think, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Uh, a, a prayer that uh, we should all pray regularly uh, is uh, that God would raise up, uh, prepare, uh, support laborers for the harvest. Uh, there's never been a problem uh, with the number of people who are willing to come to Jesus. It has always been a problem of leadership. We always need more laborers in the harvest. Uh, and that, that was true in Jesus' days, is still true in the modern church. Uh, there are never enough. Uh, and, uh, and the reasons for that are complex. I know that, and so do you. Uh, but uh, that always needs to be our prayer. Uh, chapter 10, we've got a, a listing. Uh, the first part of the chapter, the first few verses, one through four, is uh, uh, Matthew's first listing of the 12 apostles. Uh, and uh, uh, this starts out with uh, Simon called Peter, Andrew, his brother, uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and then all of the rest, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector, and then another James, this one, the son of Alphaeus, and uh, Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, we'll notice that uh, Philip and uh, Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew have quite a bit of uh, uh, tradition associated with them. Uh, and the gospels say quite a few more things about them. Uh, by the time we get to James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot, we don't really hear very much about them in the New Testament. Uh, there are traditions about the, the rest of their lives and their careers. They went on to to preach and to plant churches, but we don't hear nearly as much about them as about the, the core group of the disciples. And of course, Judas Iscariot, uh, we, we have plenty of tradition about. He killed himself after betraying Jesus, and this was not a good thing. Uh, Jesus uh, in chapter 10 is going to be sending out the, the 12. The 12 apostles were sent on this first sort of missionary journey. And in this case, it's going to be only to the Jews, only into the synagogues. Uh, we're, we're after the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, and if anyone receives you, go on in, uh, take what they give you, stay as long as you're welcome. If you're not welcome, shake the dust off your feet and go elsewhere. Um, in, uh, uh, in the world of uh, sales, which is a place that I used to inhabit when I was much younger. Uh, we learned to do something called qualifying. Uh, when, uh, when I would try to make a sales pitch to somebody, uh, I, I used to do this on the telephone. Sometimes I would do it door to door. I've, I've done some door to door sales and I'd never liked that. Um, and uh, I've never liked selling on the telephone either, but I can remember selling stuff on the telephone. And in the first few seconds, the idea is to identify yourself uh, and uh, uh, strike up a conversation with the person who answered the phone and discover whether or not there is any possibility at all that they have any interest. Uh, and usually when, uh, when you're talking to somebody, you can tell within the first 15 or 20 seconds whether this phone call is going to be worth your effort. 
Uh, and uh, if it's not going to be worth your effort, you don't have to be rude, but you do need to go on to the next prospect. Uh, and uh, uh, so thank you very much. I really appreciate your time click and away you go and you get on to the next one. Uh, once you learn that technique, selling is easier. It's still not something I enjoy doing and I, I was never very good at it, uh, but it, it gets a little easier. Uh, and the same with, I, I sold Fuller Brush for a while and you knock at a door and, uh, uh, and a lady comes to the door and uh, uh, you tell her, uh, ma'am, I'm here to, here to demonstrate a new perfume and spray a little on her arm uh, that only smells good on the most beautiful of women. Uh, and if you get a laugh from that, you can go on with your sales pitch. Uh, if 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 the lady is angry, then you thank her for her time and go on. <laughs> it's, it was stupid, but strangely enough, it worked. Uh, so uh, Jesus says, out you go, uh, try this. Uh, go to evangelism, share the gospel of the kingdom, and where people listen, stay and teach them and see if you can't get a little body of the righteous remnant praying for you. Uh, if they don't want to hear, shake the dust off your feet and move on to the next one. You don't have to get mad at them. You don't have to tell them they're going to hell. Uh, you just go on to the next prospect and continue. This is a, a principle that's good for all of us in the ministry. Uh, when we're sharing the gospel, uh, uh, sometimes we win and sometimes we don't. Uh, and uh, when, when people say no, I, I can feel badly about that. Um, and uh, if it's somebody I really care about, uh, I'm likely to come back later and try again. Uh, but if somebody says no, they're not rejecting you, uh, they're rejecting Jesus. Uh, and that's a sad thing. Uh, it's not something to make me angry. It's a sad thing. Uh, and so the disciples are told, go on. Uh, if they continue rejecting me, that's, uh, that's the way it'll come. Uh, Jesus talks about persecution to come. Uh, because the disciple is not above his teacher. This is verse 24 of chapter 10, uh, nor a servant above his master. Uh, it's enough for the disciple to be like his teacher. But if they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, which means Lord of the flies, by the way, kind of a nasty thing. It's a name for uh, Satan. How much more will they malign those of the household? Uh, if, they, if they have rejected and crucified me, Jesus is telling us, what do you suppose they're likely to do to you? Don't, don't expect to be treated any better. Um, have no fear. One of my favorite verses in chapter 10 is verse 29, uh, where uh, Jesus is saying, don't be afraid of them. Don't don't worry about this persecution. Uh, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. <laughs> so I've often wondered about that. Sparrows are everywhere. Uh, as sparrows are little, little bitty birds. Have I got a sparrow someplace? I don't think I've got a sparrow. Somewhere else in uh, one of the gospels, probably in the gospel of Luke, I've got a picture of a sparrow. Uh, but here, two sparrows sold for a penny. Now, I don't know who buys sparrows. I didn't know there was a market for sparrows. Uh, that, there certainly isn't enough meat on a sparrow to make a decent soup, and it would probably take more than two. Uh, so I don't know who sells a sparrow, but it's interesting that a sparrow is a... Uh, uh, it's a remarkable little bird. A uh, sparrow is about, oh, about three inches long and it can fly. Uh, and uh, as it flies, 
uh, the nerve endings in its wings and in its tail are reading the air pressure at every spot uh, in every feather on the whole bird and sending those impulses to that little bird brain, which is a tiny little thing, uh, which instantly corrects for every change. Uh, sparrows are tiny little things, and yet they are more complex than the most expensive airplane you could ever ever buy today. Uh, uh, the um, uh, the uh, U United States has a thing called the B-1 bomber. I think it's a B-1, maybe it's a B-2. Whichever the one is that's a big stealth bomber. And it, uh, uh, you can't see it on radar directly. Uh, and it's uh, uh, shaped like a flying wing. And it can only fly because it's got uh, this great, big, complex, expensive computer that monitors the pressures and it monitors all of the systems and it changes things so that the pilot is actually just giving orders. He's not actually controlling the various surfaces of the plane. The computer does all of that. That computer is uh, several million times less complex than the computer in a sparrow. <laughs> And yet God builds sparrows that he can sell at a profit to for a penny. Uh, it, it, it's amazing. Uh, sometimes I, I, I wish we had God building our B-2 bombers in, <laughs> instead of the U.S. Uh, Defense Department. Uh, maybe we could do it uh, less expensively. But look at this. Not one will fall to the ground without your father being aware of it. And you are worth more than many sparrows. So when we have trouble out in the ministry, uh, don't forget that God knows, um, God puts more value on us than many other things that he also cares about and takes care of. He'll take care of us. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a good thing. In uh, uh, 1034 and following, don't think I've come to bring peace on the earth, but a sword. That's not an encouraging thought. Uh, the, uh, the Old Testament says there will come a time when we'll be beat our swords into uh, plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. But it is not this day. Uh, and there, there is a time uh, for, uh, for struggle. Uh, and uh, uh, Jesus says there's a time for, for a sword. Okay, chapter 11 is going to take us into another, uh, another section. This is a, a variety of challenges to the king's authority, all the way uh, from uh, 11 through uh, 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 the early part of chapter 16. Uh, the uh, scribes and Pharisees and others, uh, the cities of the Jews all throughout uh, the Galilee are going to uh, reject Jesus' authority. Uh, we see this, first of all, with the, uh, the uh, uh, message from John the Baptist. I'm just going to go straight to the, uh, to the text. We'll, we'll come back and see these. Uh, in uh, chapter 11, beginning verse 2, John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, and he sent word saying, are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? Now, this is actually a, a reasonable question. This doesn't show a lack of faith on John's part. Uh, John literally wants to know. Uh, and uh, Jesus answered, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. <laughs> so essentially, that's very good news. Uh, so the messengers went away and they went back and told John. And presumably, John was impressed with this listing of evidence. Uh, Jesus never expected anyone 
to believe his message uh, without authenticating evidence. Uh, and the, uh, the miracles and the preaching of the gospel are intended to be evidence. Uh, as we see these things and hear these things, uh, as we see lives transformed, that is the evidence. Okay, well, this, this goes on. Uh, and uh, uh, John the Baptist is an important character and we see him uh, coming up. We're going to see him uh, murdered by Herod here shortly. Uh, in uh, later on in chapter 11, beginning in verse 20, we see the denunciation of a couple of cities. This photograph, uh, kind of uh, hazy in the background, but still pretty good, is a basalt synagogue in uh, Chorazin, uh, one of the cities that Jesus preached to, and one that he denounced. Here he says, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. Chorazin is on the hill overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Bethsaida uh, was a port city uh, in uh, uh, New Testament times. It's uh, just slightly up the River Jordan from the Sea of Galilee uh, and uh, uh, was, uh, was a fairly important port. Uh, both of these places has been very well excavated and there's lots to see. Uh, so if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. I tell you, it'll be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than it will be for you. <coughs> so that's not a nice thing to say. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, Jesus did relatively few miracles. Uh, in the uh, the cities around the Sea of Galilee. This was his headquarters. Uh, and uh, yet uh, relatively little happened there. He stayed out of the cities, out in the countryside. In uh, verse nine, uh, in, actually we're in chapter 12 and verse nine, we're gonna see a healing on the Sabbath. Uh, one of the fun things that, uh, that Jesus uh, does all the way through the Gospel of Matthew, I will see this in Mark and Luke as well. I won't spend a lot of time with each episode, but something that Jesus does a lot uh, is uh, to uh, rattle the chains of the Pharisees. Uh, sometimes I believe Jesus goes out of his way uh, the, uh, uh, the gospel writers uh, often playfully note uh, that, that Jesus and his disciples were doing this, that, or the other thing. And the Pharisees were nearby watching. And so Jesus said, do this or that or the other in order to get a rise out of the Pharisees. So the Pharisees come running over and they are all upset. <laughs> And uh, uh, Jesus is so happy for that. He seems to relish the conflict. So here he goes and he shows up in the synagogue of the Jews uh, and, uh, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they, the synagogue rulers asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Uh, and uh, they said this so that they might accuse him. And he said to them, which one of you has a sheep if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? <laughs> what a question. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Since the Bible itself, the Old Testament says if, a, if an ox falls into a pit or a sheep, uh, falls into the mud, you can certainly reach down and lift him out. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. That's clear from the Old Testament. And so he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and it was restored, healthy like the other. And the Pharisees went out and conspired against him, how to destroy him. What nice guys. Uh, don't you just love the Pharisees? You're not supposed to. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Pharisees are the, the quintessential bad guys. 
<laughs> there, this is Simon Legree and uh, Darth Vader all rolled together. They're they're just they're just mean and vicious. Uh, the the fact of the matter is that not all of the scribes or all of the Pharisees were equally bad guys. Uh, some of them were actually uh, good guys. This was just their tradition. Many of the Pharisees actually became believers. Uh, so it's it, it not quite as simple as we sometimes uh, try to paint it. Uh, nevertheless, Jesus was often uh, more than happy uh, to r rattle the cage of the Pharisees, and he does that here. In uh, chapter uh, 12, and let's see, we've got uh, the withered hand, we've got uh, Jesus going through the grain fields, uh, the chosen servant, blasphemy again. You know, I need to do that one. Uh, this is a, this is fairly brief. Again, this is a part of the uh, dispute with the Pharisees. As the uh, 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 Pharisees are arguing with Jesus, they said, this man has a demon. He's healing by Beelzebul, the prince of the demons. Uh, and uh, Jesus said, uh, responded to them, you know, guys, that is really stupid. Uh, a kingdom that's divided against itself will be laid waste. The city or house that's divided against itself will never stand. Uh, and in fact, at verse uh, 31, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. You name it sin, blasphemy, all of the rotten things that people can do in life, we can forgive that. But the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. Uh, people ask, what is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? And the simple answer here is that the, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is a thing that the Pharisees did during the life of Christ. They were eyewitnesses to the miracles of Christ on earth. And responding to the evidence of their own eyes, they attributed those miracles to demons. And Jesus said, this is amazing. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. There's no forgiveness of that. That just, you guys can go away. And it was over. Uh, following that, he uh, 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 he talks about the uh, uh, the tree known by its fruit. We've already seen that once, but we'll see it again here. Uh, this is verse uh, 33 of chapter 12. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and the fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. Uh, you brood of vipers. <laughs> uh, a, a viper is a poisonous snake. You bunch of snakes, you're talking to the scribes and Pharisees. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So everything you say is a lie. Everything you say is evil. All of the fruit that comes out of this evil tree is going to be an evil thing. You'll know the tree by its fruit. Uh, you can't tell in the middle of the winter what that tree is, but wait till next spring. Let's see what kind of leaves come up. And as the summer goes on, let's see what kind of fruit grows. Ah, that's an apple tree and they're good apples. Well, I guess that's a good tree uh, or it's a, crab apple tree and they're little and hard and sour. Well, that's a bad tree then. It's easy to tell once you see the fruit. In our lives, the fruit is evident. Uh, Paul later on is going to talk about the fruit of the spirit. Uh, to look at the way somebody lives. You see their love and joy and peace and patience and long suffering. Uh, that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is alive and well and functioning in this individual. Uh, you see uh, fighting and lies and uh, 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 blasphemy and abuse and terror. Uh, that 
comes from somebody else. There's nothing good in that tree. Uh, and that's, that's how you can tell. Okay, very simple. Uh, then he ends his dispute with the, uh, the Pharisees, end of chapter 12, with the sign of Jonah. Some of the scribes and Pharisees saying, teacher, we would like to see a sign from you. Like he hasn't done enough already. Uh, the, the whole point of everything from 8 through 12 thus far has been Jesus' demonstration of his authority by doing miracles. And so the scribes say, we want to see another one. And he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign is going to be given you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Ah, there's Jonah. Just as Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and nights in the depths of the earth. And then he will come back. Uh, so... <clears throat> Jesus apparently believes that Jonah actually spent three days in the belly of a big fish. Modern critics of the New Testament have, uh, um, uh, they tell us that they have uh, not believed in the story of <coughs> Jonah and his fish for a hundred years. And uh, frankly, I feel sorry for them. If you don't believe in the story of Jonah's fish, uh, how is it that you believe anything else in that book is true? I'm sorry, uh, but um, there is the sign. You don't believe the sign? Well, even if somebody comes back from the dead, as we're going to see later, uh, you'll not believe. It's just not going to happen. So that's the sign of Jonah. Uh, unclean spirit, mothers and brothers. Let's go to chapter 13. Now, this is probably where we'll end up today. Uh, the, uh, the parables. Uh, Matthew collects a whole bunch of parables into one chapter, chapter 13. There are some parables elsewhere. And interestingly, Luke tends to spread the parables around. And he doesn't do all of the same parables, and sometimes they turn up a little differently. Uh, I suspect uh, that Jesus told parables a lot uh, when he was preaching to the crowds. I think he told the parables uh, in uh, different ways every time he told them, uh, just, just like I do. I tell stories, uh, and every time I tell a story, it turns up a little differently. And people who've uh, sat through different editions of my classes uh, tell me, you told that story five years ago when I took your class, uh, but you told it a little differently today. <laughs> yes, that's, that's how that works. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm willing to bet that Jesus told the parable of the sower uh, 50 different times. Uh, and I almost guarantee it came out 50 different ways. Uh, and uh, 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 critics of the New Testament uh, say, well, look at this, this parable in Matthew, and now compare it in Luke. There are three words different. Obviously, somebody's lying. This is errors. No, it's not. <laughs> Matthew remembers it differently than Luke remembered it. And there, there you have it. Uh, Matthew remembered the way he told it in Capernaum uh, on the fourth Thursday of this day, this uh, uh, month, and Luke remembered a different version because he was talking to somebody else. Um, why is there a problem? I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, the critics are like that. Anyway, the parables <clears throat> are a collection of stories about the kingdom. Now, remember, Matthew is talking about the kingdom of heaven, which begins with the earthly ministry of Christ, continues while Jesus is absent during the church age, and will continue during the earthly ministry of Christ during the millennial kingdom. Uh, so there are different phases to the kingdom age. And the principles that we saw in the Sermon on the Mount are 
true during the whole kingdom age. These are ideals. These are principles that are always true. The parables illustrate the same principles, but coming from a different point of view. And parables are uh, typically simple, earthly stories that have a, uh, have a spiritual meaning. In other words, there's some, uh, there's some godly principle. There is some, uh, there is some moral to the story. Now, not all stories have morals, <laughs> okay? But a parable does. Uh, the parable is designed to teach some large uh, spiritual or supernatural principle, some philosophic principle, something that is universally true. And the, uh, the story is told with uh, details that tend to fit the story. Um, one of the most important things to remember about the interpretation, well, there are several things that are important to remember about interpreting parables. One, uh, often Jesus will give the interpretation of the parable in the context of the parable itself. Like prophecy in the Old Testament, oft times the interpretation of the prophecy is given in the context. And so just read another paragraph and there's your answer. The same is true with the parables. Jesus goes to the trouble of explaining the whole parable in several instances, and we'll look at those uh, because that help us to understand how he is using figurative language, a figure of speech. Uh, he's telling an earthly story, uh, but because it's a parable, the sower may not actually exist. Jesus is not necessarily pointing at somebody sowing seed. He's simply telling a story. He's saying, let's, let's imagine a sower went out to sow. And here's what happens. The second principle, the first principle is always look for the interpretation in the context. The second principle is, don't make a parable get down on all four feet. <laughs> Don't make it get down on all four. Let it, let it tell its own story. Generally speaking, a parable is about one thing. So it's a mistake to try to take every detail of the parable and make a separate uh, principle out of each individual point. Uh, so who is the sower? Uh, oh, well, the sower is uh, this preacher or that prophet or the Messiah or whoever we decide the sower is. Uh, in the illustration that's given here, Jesus doesn't identify the sower. He just says, let's imagine a sower going out to sow. Does it matter who the sower is? Frankly, no, <laughs> because the, the parable is actually not the parable of the sower. The parable is not the parable of the seeds. It's a parable of the soils. There are four kinds of soil. Let's have a look at that parable because it, it uh, will take us a little farther into it. A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path. The birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground. They didn't have much soil and immediately they sprang up. Since they had no depth of soil, when the sun rose, they were scorched and they had no root, they withered. Other seeds fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundred, some 60, some 30 fold. Okay, how, how cool is that? That's a, that's a great little story. Uh, and uh, Jesus went on to tell other stories like this. And the, uh, the, uh, as we carry on in uh, chapter 13, beginning at verse 10, the disciples said, why, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus said, well, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. 
Jesus spoke to the crowds often in parables that they were not prepared to understand. They weren't ready to understand. <clears throat> Later on, some of those people would become believers. And over time, they would hear the rest of the gospel message, and they would begin to understand. And they would look back at passages like this and say, ah, now I see. Uh, but they weren't ready yet. Uh, so Jesus is teaching in easy to grasp object lessons that he calls parables. Uh, and uh, the disciples were given to know a little more. So verse uh, 15 or verse uh, 18 of chapter 13, Jesus says, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom of heaven, okay, there's the word of the kingdom. What is that? Well, any principles that have to do with the kingdom of Christ, whether that's in the preaching of the disciples in Galilee, whether that's during the church age, whether that's the preaching of, of teachers who will be sent out during the millennial kingdom, uh, all of this is going to happen. And uh, what it all has in common is that the king has a message for everyone. And there will be those who teach and those who preach this kingdom, those who publish it in various ways, whether in books or in artwork or on the internet. What I'm doing right now is a kind of sowing of kingdom seed. I'm teaching God's word. That's what I do for a living. Uh, and out it goes onto the internet, and I'm going to upload it later to Facebook and YouTube. Uh, and I uh, deliberately make those things public. So anybody who's searching for the Gospel of Matthew on the internet uh, will see a video by Dr. McMath about the Gospel of Matthew. Some will listen and will say, oh, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. Uh, and they'll turn me off after 30 seconds, and it will do them absolutely no good. Jesus said, those are people who are like rocky ground. The, uh, the seeds bounce, uh, and uh, the birds come and eat it, and it does no good. Uh, was, uh, was the sower faithful? Yes, he sowed the seed. Some of the seed went into places where it's not going to do anything. It's going to land on the ground. Uh, and the birds are going to come and take it away. Do we have to know which particular birds they are? No. <laughs> it's just, it doesn't matter. Birds eat seeds. Uh, what's, what's going to happen to the seeds that are not uh, responded to? Well, nothing. <laughs> they, they rot. They get eaten. They go away, they blow off into the gravel, whatever. Uh, 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 there again, the, the point of the exercise uh, is uh, the message of God's words to people who listen. Other seeds fell on rocky ground. Jesus said the, the rocky ground has some soil, uh, but there's a, a, maybe there's rock just below the surface, or maybe there's a bunch of big rocks uh, like we have here near where we live big rocks all in all of the fields. Uh, farmers in our area say that uh, uh, they, they may try to grow wheat, but mostly they grow rocks. And every year, uh, the frost in the ground pushes the rocks up toward the surface. And they'll go around with trailers behind their, uh, their tractors out in these fields. Uh, and uh, a, a lot of uh, the classic farmers in this valley uh, used to have lots of children so that they could follow along behind the trailer and pick rocks out of the field so that they'd have a chance of planting something this year. The rocky ground uh, tends to uh, yield uh, plants right away quickly. These seeds germinate because it's hot. 
uh, the sun comes up and uh, if there's a little bit of moisture, the seeds germinate and up comes the plant and it looks good, <coughs> but it doesn't have much soil. Uh, and uh, uh, so it's burnt by the sun. Uh, we have a field here at, uh, on our property where one of the places where the horse is supposed to go grazing and that, that field is always dry. Uh, in the springtime, we have uh, actually a pretty good sized field. It's about an acre big and half of it is very wet and the other half is very dry. And we we plant seed there, we plant grass seed uh, and it grows up early in the spring, but then as soon as the sun comes out, it disappears. Uh, some people hear the word of God. This is not necessarily the gospel. Uh, the word of God re refers to every principle that Jesus teaches, which, which includes, frankly, the whole Bible. You look at it and Jesus is the authority for the whole of the word of God. Uh, but the whole of the word of God goes out. And some people see a principle or two, they listen to a sermon or they read a book or they listen to a video and they say, wow, that's really cool. I really like that. Uh, I think I'll go try that. Uh, and uh, maybe this person is Christian, uh, but because he has so little depth, uh, the, uh, the idea never really takes root. It never takes off in his life. Uh, so he, he tr he's trying to turn over a new leaf, for instance, but the old habits just come back and uh, nothing changes. Uh, in other places, the seeds fell among thorns. Uh, thorns are weeds. Uh, here in our part of the world, we have, uh, we have all kinds of weeds. Uh, Donna uh, goes out every spring and uh, sprays weeds. And later on in the summer, I go with her and we pull weeds uh, until I start uh, uh, passing out from the exertion. Yeah, I actually did that this last year. I was out in the sun and I got feeling faint pulling weeds. I hate weeds. Uh, we have knapweed and we have a thing called horseweed, which is really nasty, really icky stuff. Uh, we have vetch. I really don't like vetch. Uh, and we have woolly mullen, which sounds like it ought to be really pretty, but it's ugly, really nasty stuff. A single woolly mullen uh, can grow just about anywhere the soil has been disturbed, uh, whether it's rocky or not. And uh, when it grows, it makes a seed pod, actually a seed head that has hundreds of thousands of individual seeds. And if you wait until there's a seed head on that thing and you uh, uh, clip that to take it away and burn it, the seeds, the individual little tiny microscopic seeds jump everywhere and cover everything and they go everywhere, it's terrible. Uh, I've always wondered why it's so much easier to raise weeds than to raise good crops. Why is it that, uh, you know, a cherry tree is so hard to raise, uh, but woolly mullen seems to grow everywhere? Uh, awful. Other seed fell on good soil. Sometimes people respond to the word of God and it produces fruit, sometimes a hundredfold. You get a really, really good crop with some people, some 60, some 30-fold. If you get a 30-fold crop, that's really actually very good. It's not great, but it's very good. People grow at different rates. The word that is being sown here, the word of the kingdom, the message of the kingdom is not necessarily the gospel. So we're not talking about people who get saved and then get lost. We're not talking about people who hear the gospel, but the concerns of life get in the way, and so they lose their salvation. That's a wrong way of understanding this. The seed that the sower sows is the word of God. As we teach, as we preach, as we share, some people respond more than others. And when they respond, they produce more fruit, some more than others. 
and you're looking for the fruit. That ultimately is what we're after. Uh, Jesus goes on in this chapter. There's another uh, uh, another parable I really like, the parable of the uh, of the weeds. Uh, the parable of the sower was explained. The parable of the weeds is another one. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while he was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, there were weeds also. And the servant said, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How is it that there are weeds? And he said, an enemy has done this. Those servants said, then do you want us to go and gather them? He said, no. Less than the gathering the weeds you wrote up, uh, uh, gathering the weeds you wrote up, the wheat along with them. Let them grow together until the harvest. At the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, what's the, what's the point? Uh, the explanation begins at uh, verse 36. He left the crowds, went into the base. They said, uh, the disciples said, explain the parable of the weeds. He said, the one who sows good seed is the son of man. The good seed, as you remember, is the, the word of the kingdom, the principles of scripture, all of them, not just the gospel. The field is the world. The good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. So uh, what's going on? Uh, as we go out into the world and as we begin raising up fruit, we're going to notice that not all the fruit looks alike. And some of it is actually the fruit of the devil's principles. Uh, and sometimes in the church, we're going to find people who actually don't belong there. Uh, and Jesus says, by their fruit, you will know them. Uh, but leave them. You don't have to drive them away. At the end of time, uh, the angels will gather the weeds and the rest will be burned. <laughs> now, this isn't specifically about the gospel, uh, but it, it has some gospel uh, principles. Uh, but I'm not going to go there. I'll, I'll let uh, individual preachers do what they will with this one. Uh, but the uh, the idea of teaching scripture every place that we can and watching for the development of fruit, we encourage the fruit. Uh, and we put up with the weeds uh, because that's the way it's going to work. Uh, mustard seed, the kingdom of heaven is like uh, a, a grain of mustard seed. We'll talk about mustard seeds later. Mustard seeds are litter. The parable of the hidden treasure. It's like a treasure hidden in a field. Huh, what does that mean? <laughs> we don't know, <laughs> but it's kind of fun. The, the pearl of great value. Uh, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had in order to buy it. Sometimes when you're studying the scripture, you realize uh, that the principles that are here are worth more than anything else in the world. And you realize this is worth giving up everything else for. Uh, that's the attitude that Jesus is ultimately looking for. Uh, the uh, parable of the net. So, uh, the uh, the fisherman throws his net out into the sea and he gathers up all kinds of fish, uh, some good fish, some bad fish, uh, and you sort them out at, uh, at the end. Um, okay. As we, uh, uh, as we end today, I'm going to uh, stop the, uh, stop the share. Let's, let's end here with the, uh, the conclusion of, uh, of chapter 13. Uh, uh, that um, Jesus intends to uh, send his disciples out into the world uh, to uh, uh, to teach the gospel of the kingdom, the good news that the king is present and the word of God is available to everyone. And he has instructed them to watch for growth, for fruit. 
Earlier on, he said, you can tell the difference between a good tree and a bad tree by the fruit. Now he's teaching them as you work, as you, as you go ahead with the ministry of the kingdom, keep an eye open for the fruit. Because the fruit in the midst of the field is worth the whole thing. They, uh, the, uh, the commitment you find in people to the word of God is worth the price. It's worth what it costs. So that's as far as we can go today. We'll come back on Monday. <clears throat> and we'll actually begin right at the end of chapter 13. Uh, and uh, we'll get uh, quite a ways into Matthew on uh, on Monday. I'm expecting that we'll get, uh, well, I don't know how far we'll get. I hope we'll get at least through chapter 16, and, uh, Peter's confession, but I, I think we'll get a little beyond that. At least two more days in Matthew. So we'll see you again on Monday. God bless everybody. I'm glad that uh, that you could uh, join us today. Uh, and, uh, have uh, enjoy God's blessing in the ministry uh, as uh, as you sow. Uh, let God provide the increase. He does, and He will. God bless you. Bye bye. Thank you, Doctor John. Bye bye. Thank you, John. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.